It was very difficult during the Obama presidency to get people to pay attention to all the wars the U.S. was involved in. I think people somehow had this mistaken idea that Obama had taken us out of the wars when in fact we got involved in more wars, including drone warfare, which was Obama's signature weapon. Uh, with both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, I don't think there's any similar illusion. People know that both of them are, quote, tough on security, uh, both very pro-militarist, pro especially Hillary Clinton, who has shown through her career that she is very quick to use the military as a force for intervention. So I think it won't matter all that much who is president. What will matter is that we start rebuilding the kind of movement we had under George Bush when we could mobilize hundreds of thousands of people onto the streets. We have to do that same kind of thing whoever is in the White House. Code Pink has been involved in anti-war work since before uh, the invasion of Iraq, but we found that uh, over the years, the media stopped paying attention to us and the other um, peace activists. So we had to find new and more creative ways to attract media attention. Sometimes that means going to where the media already is. So for example, I went to a speech that President Obama was giving about national defense and stood up during his speech and challenged him on drones and on Guantanamo, where all the national and international media was right there. A similar thing during the Republican convention when Donald Trump was giving his acceptance speech, the biggest speech that you could give, um, I got up on a table inside the convention with a banner that said, build bridges, not wars. And my colleagues do these kind of things as well. It's very scary. Our hearts are like beating like this. Uh, we oftentimes get beat up by the people around us. Uh, I've had my shoulder dislocated. Uh, one of our uh, young women had to be in therapy for a year after getting beaten up and pulled uh, by her neck. Uh, so you never know what's going to happen. It takes a lot of risk. But we always think of the people who are dying and suffering and uh, traumatized by our policies and don't have a choice. And that gives us the courage to do these kind of things. When Bernie Sanders was running, it was amazing how much this elderly, um, not very charismatic guy got so much attention from so many young people. And they dropped their schools, they dropped their jobs, and they went to work on his campaign. And amazing, the enthusiasm among the 20-year-olds. And part of the enthusiasm was how clear his message was about inequalities. He didn't talk too much about the foreign policy issues, which was unfortunate. Um, but he did um, get people charged up to say that we shouldn't live in a country where people can't get a free college education, where you can't have decent health care, where we are destroying our environment so the fossil fuel industry can keep making profits. And I think that message really sunk into a lot of people, so much so that in a very conservative country like the United States, the young generation now looks at socialism more favorably than they look at capitalism. That's Bernie Sanders' legacy. And I think that will have a big impact for years to come, where those young people will get involved in many different things. Some of them will stay within the Democratic Party and fight for change within. Many of them will be disillusioned and will go work outside the party on issues like uh, living wage for all, getting money out of politics, environmental issues. Hopefully some will get involved around the peace issues. So I think the legacy will be there, but in a more dispersed kind of way.
The culture of violence in our societies is so uh, ingrained and the military is so glorified that you see the influence of military going into the schools and encouraging young, young people to learn how to shoot weapons, to join the military. Uh, you see how the uh, sports arenas become uh, places where uh, people stand up and sing the anthem and pledge their allegiance. And it's all part of this uh, drumbeat to uh, glorify war. It's uh, quite ironic when you look in the United States that we've been losing wars since the time of Vietnam. And our huge military, bigger than any other military, almost as big as the rest of the militaries combined, can't win wars anymore. So I think um, the people have got to a place where not only are we tired of war, what we say war weary, but also war wise where more and more people understand that glorifying the military is not the answer, that militarism is not the answer, that uh, these last 15 years since the 9-11 attacks has only brought more terrorist groups, more insecurity, and uh, more war. So I think we have to uh, get at the roots of military. We have to teach nonviolence in the schools. We have to teach our children nonviolence. And uh, we have to push back against the glorification of war. I think that if we want to choose the path of compassion, kindness, and political, not military solutions, we have to choose the path of nonviolence. We've seen the disaster that happened in the Middle East after the excitement of the Arab Spring when people thought they could change their governments through nonviolent means uh, and then were either attacked violently or some of them decided to pick up a gun. Um, and the result is just an unending cycle of violence. I think nonviolence is the only path we have because we don't have power when it comes to violence. When it comes to violence, the governments have all the power. Um, they have the uh, massive amounts of weapons that we can never have. So whether it's by conviction or whether it's just by practicality, um, Nonviolence is the only solution. And I feel that we have to be much more determined and creative and bold in the way we use nonviolence and uh, also be uh, more appealing to other people so that we really have mass movements for nonviolence. Because in the years to come, the only way we're going to stop the present wars and stop the military industrial complex that benefits tremendously from keeping the wars going is if we have massive nonviolent movements. Unfortunately, the mainstream media is part of the problem, not part of the solution. They're part of now what is the military, industrial, security, congressional, academic media complex because they all just revolve around the same issue of feeding into the war machine. So we need independent media, we need alternative media, we need truthful media that uh, explains the disaster of war, that connects the war issue to other issues like why we don't have uh, good health care in our countries, like we don't have uh, good educational systems, why our infrastructure is falling apart, why we don't have the green energy we need uh, to make sure this planet survives, because we're putting so much money into our militaries. So we need the media to educate us about that. We need the media to educate us uh, about how institutions like NATO are part of the problem, not part of the solution. 
information. Uh, we need the media to educate us about the wars that we are in, about what is drone warfare all about, and why it so violates uh, what should be our moral convictions to be sitting remotely, comfortably, pressing a button, killing people thousands of miles away we don't even know. We need to explain to people how racism and war is so connected, how you can't go kill people unless you dehumanize those people and treat them as less than uh, human beings. And so I think all of these things are uh, so key. For example, uh, teaching people how uh, if they care about the environment, they have to care about war, how war is the biggest polluter, how wars are more and more about wars for resources. Uh, so, so many ways that we need the media to teach us um, about how war is so bad for us, not only because it kills people, but it kills the future.